hello everyone and thank you for joining us today in discussing what's happening in the startup ecosystem in the so-called she era um, and what does that really mean uh, for us and in terms of uh, funding and support uh, to further increase um, female entrepreneurship in tech. So my name is Jenny. Uh, I'm founder of Women in Tech Asia, a community platform with a mission to showcase and support female role models in the tech space. And I will be your moderator while together with our esteemed speakers, we are defining what does she era mean to us and diving into topics such as initiatives that help women get better access to funding, uh, better access for women to social capital through mentorship and networks, reflecting on a founder's own journey in fund, you know, building her business as well as uh, examining alternative ways of investing through gender lens uh, investments. So first, uh, let's start by introducing our speakers. So uh, Xu Yin, who is the partner at Padamar Capital, a VC firm focused on South and Southeast Asia's mass market and is also committed to gender lens investing. Uh, Susan, the co-founder of Superhands, a Malaysia-based end-to-end data labeling partner for AI and machine learning companies. Uh, and Will, a managing, a managing partner at Kupun Capital, an early stage VC firm focused on fast-growing digital and deep tech startups in South Southeast Asia. And who have recently launched a female founders mentoring hours initiative. So, and I, if I'm not mistaken, you currently have around uh, under your belt about 300 meetings, 80 female founders mentored and 30 mentors uh, from 23 funds, correct? 320 meetings, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's quite a lot. So we have, we have a lot to cover, uh, lots to discuss. And so I guess uh, without further ado, let's, let's get started. Um, so, and I guess the whole gist of today's conversation is going to be also around like defining and discussing around our experiences and your um, current role in the ecosystem when it comes to uh, supporting female entrepreneurs and especially when you know globally uh, female founders have been facing challenges such as lack of funding so and in some estimates uh, we're looking at you know three to uh, three uh, two to three percent of total investments are going to female founders and so that's a fraction of the of the pot that is that is out there so would love to kind of dig deeper into um how we can best solve this issue and kind of what kind of support mechanisms especially will and uh Shuyin, you're currently building that addresses this issue so uh yeah so why don't we start with that so um you know maybe uh Shuyin, you could uh start by just um sharing a bit about what made you go into uh, alternative investment thesis such as uh, gender lens investing and what does that mean um, for you and kind of what, what do you do in this space? Right. Um, so, yeah, so I think as, as you mentioned, we're a venture capital firm and, you know, we, we also call ourselves impact investors, which means, you know, I think since our very inception, I mean, we've been really committed to, um, you know, I think equality in, in many respects, right? Not just gender equality, but also, um, you know, equality in an economic sense and providing more opportunities for, for the mass market, right? And, and low, in, low income uh, populations. Um, and, you know, I think we've been unconscious gender lens investors in, in some ways for quite a long time. Um, we started off investing in the microfinance sector. And I think, as, as most people would know, um, most microfinance borrowers are, are women, right? So I think and it's very hard to be a successful microfinance company without really understanding the needs of, um, of, of these women um, very well, right? So I think that was a lens we applied, I think, you know, decades ago, actually. Uh, but we really only formalized our approach to gender lens investing more recently. And I think fundamentally why we do it is because we believe it will help us get you know, additional data and ask better questions to help make better decisions at our firm. Um, and I think also it will help us uh, you know, manage our own internal processes you know, more effectively and really attract the best talent to, to Padma. Um, so that's kind of how we got to the, the why. Um, I think it was very interesting um, in terms of the how, right? How we actually put this in practice. Um, I think one thing I will say about gender lens investing is, you know, I think certainly investing in female founders is a very important part of that, but it's not the only piece, right? Um, you know, we also think very carefully about, you know, 
what kind of customer segments and bases are our companies serving, right? How does gender play a role in that as well? And how do we provide, you know, better services for kind of the end consumers more, um, you know, more effectively? Uh, we also look at the way that we run our own firm, as I said, right? So how does gender play a role within our own firm, the way that we make decisions? So I think, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, I think only 2% of venture funding goes to, to female um, female founders, but I think also in the investment world, right? I think about 10% or so of decision makers that invest in firms are women as well, right? So I think that also made us take a good hard look at our own internal processes and see what we could do um, to, to improve those. Uh, and, you know, I think finally I might say one of the, you know, big things that we've done recently is, is launched a whole new dedicated fund for, um, you know, for focused on, on women's economic empowerment um, and, and female founders. I think one of the big things, you know, that, that we've learned is that the venture capital model um, is not necessarily suitable for, for everyone, right? And through this fund, we wanted to provide alternative forms of financing, some more, you know, debt-focused financing um, and other kind of maybe more innovative financing products over time, which would be a better fit for a different, you know, profile of business. I think, you know, whether they're men or women, I think founders don't necessarily want to pursue this, you know, growth at all costs, you know, you know, pushing up the valuation um, kind of path. I think, and again, I don't, I think women can be great at, at pursuing that kind of particular explosive growth type of company. We simply recognize that not all founders um, have those same goals. Um, I've spoken a lot there <laughs> in, in response to your questions, but. No, yeah, and it's, to... yeah, and I would like to kind of uh, follow up on that. So like when, when you have been building uh, these vehicles, um, uh, looking at gender lens uh, investing and so uh, beacon fund is currently um, a 50 million uh, fund right so 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 then that's the, that's your newest baby uh, in the sense so so um, how, how has it been when you have been building these um, these funds and you have been talking to people about what you do I mean uh, since I've known you for for quite a few years um, quite a few years ago when we met I mean you have been in this space for for a long time so do you feel that you're answering the same questions today that you're answering maybe five years ago. You know, like, are people still asking like, why you do what you do? Or is it more like, okay, how can I get into the bandwagon and what's the right way for us or for myself to do so? Mm -hmm. When it comes to investing in, right. you know, investing in female founders. I would say there's a better appreciate, I mean, I'd love to get the other panelists, you know, thoughts on this as well. I mean, I would definitely say there's a better appreciation of the benefits of, you know, I think having diverse, say, founders amongst your portfolio and then also a diverse, say, investment team yourself. I think that that conversation, I think we've moved forward, right? I mean, of course, there's still probably further to go, but I think in terms of the, the why and what's the business case for building, you know, and I think diverse teams, not just you know, I think anything in part of our goal is to build, say, an all-female <laughs> type of team or approach, right? Um, so diverse teams, I think, really is the core. And I think there's a growing appreciation that that makes a lot of, you know, good business sense and it's also the right thing to do. As for the how, I think that's still maybe where I think we need to do a little bit more work, right? Um, because, you know, I think it, it does take quite a bit of effort. And I think we know this from our own experience to really, like, say, unpick one's investment process, right? Um, and, you know, I think the initial, our own initial reaction was like, oh, our investment process is gender blind, right? I mean, we, we don't have any biases. I think when you unpack that a little bit more, I think everyone has biases, of course, right? And there were certainly ways that we were, you know, even structuring our investment memos or having our investment committee decisions or the types of language that we would use to describe male founders versus female founders. I think once we had more training on that, right? And I think also looked at some of our unconscious biases. I think we, we were able to make some tangible improvements to, um, to our approach. However, I think it did take, I would say a period of years, right? To actually make some, you know, make, you know, go along that journey and take these steps. And I think it's, so it's really on the how and like how to actually be much more conscious about gender um, in, in the tech and venture capital world that I think is maybe where a lot of folks are right now, including ourselves, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't claim that we're totally eliminated bias at all levels um, of our organization yet either. Yeah, but that's like, that's all uh, something to aspire to. And I guess like that we, we all work uh, towards that in our own ways. Um, and um, I, uh, how about Will, um, I would like to ask you as well, because you, know, you have been, um, I mean, obviously you, you first uh, were an entrepreneur yourself and then, you know, being a successful one, then you moved on to investing uh, into, um, um, you know, founders in innovative uh, businesses. And you have been doing that for a long, long while now. And um, how, how did you kind of first pay attention to this, uh, the funding gap? 
that exists kind of how, what made you start the the mentorship uh, hours for female founders that you the, and the, the program that you currently run so so our fund is run by the two two uh, totally non-diversified people two white guys that are over 40 or even 50 uh, it can't be worse than that in 2020 and as some people told me that we were a uh, gender unfriendly fun or I mean privately to me and I basically started to do a lot of research because I actually have invested in women for the last 12 14 years and and I don't think I do see gender as one thing. I mean, we, we are actually st striving for finding the best ideas and it's really hard to find good ideas. Um, I'm sure people will say that's not true. I'm sure he's biased. Everyone is biased and, and I'm sure I'm biased by my background. But when we actually did the analysis, right, we found that we have invested in teams, no all female teams, but we have invested in a percentage of teams with females, perhaps 25%. And that's actually more than the applications that come into us because the trouble we have is that women or teams with women do not apply for venture capital. That's a big, big problem we have. And actually, so if you look at our investing and our gender profile and our, our invested companies versus our applications coming in, we, we see around 2,500 business plans a year and less than 20% of them have females on the team. Oh, wow. So, so we basically wow. said one of our LPs is Playfair Capital in the UK, and they had a program called Female Founder Mentoring Hours. Uh, two of our, uh, so 40% of us, uh, actually now is 33% of our team is, uh, is female. So, so uh, our team members, Ian and Lauren, they went ahead and, and led that effort to introduce female uh, founder mentoring hours to Southeast Asia. And the whole point about that was to see how we can make more smart females apply to Bakun Capital because there's a there's a gender gap, funding gap, but there's also an application gap. Mm. So the only thing we can do, apart from treating everyone the same and looking at the ideas and not the gender or race or religion or anything else, is to make people apply and come and come in front of us. Uh, so we launched that, we've done it twice right now. Basically what we do is that we sign up all the top VCs around Southeast Asia. We try to get female partners of the fund, if they exist, to, to join us as mentors, or if we have to, males, unfortunately. And then we meet, uh, then and a female founder that is accepted in will have four 13 minute meetings with four top VCs, basically. It's very efficient, right? Because it takes time to get to a partner, first of all. It, it takes time to set up a meeting. And access is, is a problem for every founder, right? Because VCs get inundated with, with applications. So we thought that let us find a way so female founders can shortcut into top four VCs and get going. If for nothing else than to practice, perhaps these VCs turn out to be not the right ones for, for the founder, but at least uh, now it should be pretty easy to then speak to VC number five or, or six. We actually got a lot of really competent female founders, some that even didn't need funding. Um, and I think they kind of mentored probably the partners more than, than we mentored them. I stepped in a few times as well. Uh, and we also got some super high quality uh, deal flow out of that. I mean, as, as I just read an article by someone in the US recently by Jesse Draper, uh, she basically says investing in women isn't a fucking charity. And it's not a charity. Yeah. Right? That's not why we're doing it. We're not doing it to kind of do something good. We're doing it to make money. Investing in women is extremely profitable, just as profitable as men. It's just that we lose out on probably more than 60% of, of those applications that should have come to us. They don't come to us. Mm, mm. So it's, it's a business case. That's why you're yeah, doing it. Of course. Yeah, similar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. That's what, yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, and, and going back to like when you mentioned that, you know, there's, um, you see that um, when you're receiving these applications that, you know, only 25% of those uh, have, you know, women in the team. Um, is that, do you, and kind of going, the, the funding gap that exists, is that perhaps a situation where there's also the big, the bigger reason is access to social capital? 
meaning that that is you know giving you know basically what you're trying to fix so whether that would be um mentorship network or you know fellow um um uh, successful men, uh, successfully um uh successful founders themselves kind of mentoring the ones that are up and coming uh, or you know looking at early early access to talk to the investors before you're actually in the need for applying for funds because then you know you get that that early access and that relationship building uh you know from from early on and from the get-go could be but but don't forget a lot of innovation around the world is driven by tech and that's why organizations like the ones you started and others started that's that's empowering women and making them more interested in tech is very important because a lot of people that do tech innovation today happen to be unfortunately men right or women are underrepresented and that also means that you know a lot of venture capital investments go into very high growth high margin uh you know global sometimes companies and if they and a lot of that comes from software for example where women still are underrepresented so so there are a few uh, fundamental factors that have to be fixed as well mm. so then it goes back to the the uh, beginning stage of the, the funnel which is that you know how do we get more young women to go into uh, computer science early on you know how, how we get yeah. more uh, young girls interested in engineering all of that biotech health tech mm. anything and then from there, how do you make them take that leap to apply for venture capital? What I have found is that women are more concerned with running out of cash, are more concerned and more responsible when it comes to money than men. I mean, that might be a sexist remark now towards men, but that we don't care about. And um, so when you take on venture capital, you are kind of taking on the kind of debt because you issue shares to the VC and then you feel you have to deliver. Men are much better at bullshitting and taking risk and not caring so much about raising money. And they're very happy to raise money from something for something that's kind of half baked. Whereas I feel that women are more careful and they say, before we go and actually apply to this investor, perhaps we should actually get our house in order and make sure the product is ready and make sure we have some sales. I don't know if that's true, but that's also what I feel. So I think that is also something that might hold women back from applying again that's something i cannot say you know on any statistical grounds but I, I just think that's that's also a factor you could think about addressing yeah and before i'm uh, asking asking uh, the founder's perspective from uh, susan I, I just wanted to kind of uh, jump in with uh, shuyin a bit and just what what do you think about um what do you think about so what do you see when it comes to deal flow when it comes to um uh you know the, the founders that you're looking at uh, investing in so how, how do you do you feel that there's a sense uh, of difference and yeah I, think, yeah I think to pick up on some of you know will will points right i, I think you know i, I think it's, it's we looked at it in, in the way of you know the, we saw the burden was on us as investors to like you know find you know find a way to reach female founders i think you know we'll obviously do that too by you know setting up the female founders mentoring hours etc right so i think i i would say it's you know, like, yes, they don't want to apply, right, for funding, but also, but, but why, right? And like, what are we doing which generates, you know, that, um, you know, that, that lack of, you know, interest or trust or, you know, they don't have those pre-existing relationships, et cetera, right? So I think we actually, you know, I think that, that is a, you know, that is a challenge, you know, and, and how do we also, as a fund, be more open about communicating our interest in investing in female founders, right? So I think Panama does run a number of funds. We don't only invest in female founders. And in fact, some of our early funds, I would say, had almost all kind of all male um, founding teams, right? In our latest fund, which is again not necessary, not only focused on female founders, Panama too. Um, actually, our first two investments were into women-led companies, right, with female CEOs, right? Just you know, because I think we've been much more intentional about stating our commitment to this, and it really opens up our um, kind of pipeline. As for the, the I think I, I kind of do agree, I mean, with Will around the point around kind of discipline and, you know, having a more fully baked plan before coming to, um, to, to, to investors. Um, it's, and I think that's all, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily some inherent quality that women have, because I think that would be a bit sexist, but I mean, it is, I think the conditions of the market, right? I mean, I think women do have, because they have less options when it comes to accessing funding, like naturally that makes you more resilient, right? And more resourceful um, with, with what opportunities you do have. So I would definitely also say that in terms of, you know, like discipline and kind of financial management, um, that is a common, like very positive trait that we do see in a lot of the female founders that we work with. 
Yeah, and then just, just like a side comment, I mean, um, so I, I feel like I've seen a kind of mushrooming uh, effect these these last two years when it comes to um, new, new um, up and coming gender lens uh, funds being uh, launched. Um, and I think that um, on, on, in, in, similarly, I've also um, heard from the, um, uh, the initiatives that and the funders, uh, founders of these initiatives that once they launched a you know a pot of money that was directed into you know to the, uh, to in, be invested into uh, women owned and led companies because of this you know funding gap so that it suddenly became like this whole marketing thing happened by itself it went viral so actually when it comes to a uh, quality deal deal flow um, and getting the word out um, you didn't need to invest that much into um, actual marketing of that because the, the need was so high that it kind of, you know, kind of went through the networks and the community like wildfire. So, I mean, that's um, also kind of interesting. Uh, how, and, uh, you know, but like going back to the founders uh, perspective, so Susie, and I would like to kind of ask your views on this. And, and uh, I mean, we just quickly, uh, before we started recording this, um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you haven't really you know, felt um, that your challenges, uh, you know, building a company has been so much uh, female focused uh, challenges. They have been more just general entrepreneurial challenges. Um, but um, how, how do you find, you know, when kind of starting this journey and, you know, any particular challenges that you found were something that you had to overcome and were there any particular, whether that would be an initiative or support group or people or um, kind of what, helped you build and keep on building and raising capital? Um, so like I mentioned earlier, um, before, before the call started, um, that I've been quite fortunate that um, I'm not part of uh, the female, a group of female founders that have been discriminated against. Um, and I've not felt that being female has also um, brought me further. But what's um, been really good has been um, having a great co-founder co um, for me, and he happens to be male. Um, and you know, talking about the traits that um, uh, both Will and Chiyun were talking about, um, I, I think to a certain extent you would get uh, female traits who are who tend to be a bit more conscientious. Well, that's me. And while my co-founder, um, he's a bit more extroverted and creative, and he just he just goes out there. Um, while I'm a, a bit more careful and analytical. Um, but I think this actually boils down to your individual personality um, as well. Um, and in, in terms of um, challenges um, through our journey, um, as a female co-founder, um, it's, it's been supported by um, the diversity we have in the team. Um, it's not just a, a gender uh, diversity that we have. Um, we have over 50% uh, females um, in our tech team. Um, also our uh, diverse uh, distributed uh, workforce. They're also about 60% um, female. And that was all unconscious. Um, that wasn't something that we planned to do. Um, and having this diversity has actually helped us um, along the way. Um, yeah. Right. And, and how, how do you feel in general, like when, when nowadays we're talking about, you know, um, I mean, I, th there is a kind of, I'm always sometimes still kind of um, myself wondering that, you know, because we all kind of want to be nice by the work we do and by the, the companies we build and kind of our merits and our results rather than the, the, the gender factor. But yeah. I mean, that, does it still feel kind of, kind of cool that, you know, people are like in generally now kind of like putting more focus on how, like how in general, I mean, this is statistical uh, fact that, you know, say uh, women, uh, have been women who have been leading companies and, and and building companies. They have been able to make better results with less capital, with less investment. So they have, they have been able to build bigger with less capital. And I think, uh, but is that how how do you find it? How does it feel that you are a business case for this industry? Like, does that? <laughs> I think you know? I think it's it's great that there is um, focus and emphasis, and people are more conscious about about um, like females. Uh, female entrepreneurs, um, like Shuyin and Will said, like nobody, like females aren't actually applying 
um, for these funds, but why? Um, and making it accessible, I think having that support in the community is important. Um, it doesn't mean that it's, it's not happening to me. It doesn't mean it's not happening out there. Um, and I'm sure uh, it will benefit other uh, female entrepreneurs. So I think it's actually a good thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and any, any um, and um, and looking at the geographical uh, factors, say um, because especially if you look at like Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, so traditionally they have had uh, amazing uh, figures when it comes to um, companies being set up um, and led by women. Um, but say uh, so, Shuyin, for example, like when do you go to these markets? Uh, do you see that the similar traction is also happening in the tech space? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because I think people often quote, um, say, these great gender statistics, I think whether it comes to Vietnam or there's like a couple of real standout female CEOs here, you know, there's Vietjet, there's P&J, and some amazing women. I think, you know, it doesn't, I think for, for me, um, you know, I think saying that is a little bit lazy because I think there's still a lot of work to be done um, in the broader, you know, economy, right? Whether it's in tech, and I, and I absolutely do, you know, agree with, with what Will said earlier, right? I mean, I think there's real disparities in terms of, you know, number of women graduating from STEM and, and so forth. Uh, so I think there's real gaps there, which I think still require um, us to focus on. Um, and, you know, I think we shouldn't let some of the, because I mean, a lot of the, you know, when I, when I looked at these gender statistics, right, we say like, oh, actually, you know, there's more women starting businesses than men. I mean, a lot of these were, well, I mean, a good chunk of these are micro businesses, right? And, and I think, again, there's nothing wrong with, with a micro business. I think these are often the backbone of their family's livelihoods and they're so critical. Uh, but at the same time, it didn't necessarily translate easily into like, wow, there's like more women studying, you know, high growth tech startups, right? Which I guess is what we're talking about in this, in this context. So I think, um, to me, those high level statistics never really told us the whole story. Okay, right. And, uh, and Will, like, do you, um, I mean, you see the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And yeah. And is there is there um uh, for the for the you know I'm looking at kind of in, improving this this space. So and you know obviously like there's there's um there's a whole funnel of actions that are needed to that you know the situation will get better and we'll get more um uh, female led uh, tech companies uh, into the system. And obviously like that journey starts from early on, looking at just purely looking at role models and looking at kind of awareness around this because it's hard to want to become something that you can't see. So I think that's something that I've really liked um, in recent years that there has been sort of a focus for raising those uh, female role models um, uh, out there for everyone to notice. Um, and uh, I think sometimes like the discussions that I've had also with my, my fellow uh, friends and, and people that we have been um, uh, kind of uh, showcasing through our, our network and our community um, sometimes it's also a discussion around, uh, it's not so much about you as it is about the next generation. So, um, because, you know, obviously like what, like Susan, uh, Susan mentioned, you, you want to kind of be recognized as, you know, an entrepreneur, not necessarily as a female entrepreneur, but, you know, then again, it's not really about us. It's not really about you as much as it is about the, the next generation. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, if you would, if you would be able to kind of, you know, do one thing or or support one particular thing that um, would be a um, uh, kind of the next step in the ecosystem towards where should be where we should be going. I, where where would you kind of see uh, your role as or um, kind of the the need for really really emphasize like what's the next step now that we have kind of seen this uh, like she era in terms of, you know, we have more and more female role models out there. We have more and more um, uh, gender lens uh, uh, funds. We have more and more focus on support networks and kind of that access to social capital um, uh, around uh, fem female investor, uh, female uh, founders. But uh, what what would be your choice? So maybe uh, Shuyin, maybe we start from, from you. Sure. Um, I think for me, there was, I mean, what I would encourage people to do is, I mean, to take action. And specifically, I mean, I think the starting point is always data, right? You know, we always talk about being data driven. Right? And I think the first step in, in this, you know, case, like it is for much of the, many of the problems that we deal with is like, get the data, get the baseline, right? So I think, for example, if you're an investor, you know, know what your actually like split is of, you know, applications to the companies you fund, right? I think most VCs might not even have the data that Will just, just mentioned, right, about his own funds. 
Um, and as a result, they're like, they're like, oh, you know, I think we see quite a lot of female entrepreneurs, but don't really know, right? Um, that's, you know, I think be curious about that and actually get that information. Um, and, you know, for us, the same thing goes for our portfolio companies, right? I mean, we ask them not just, oh, how many of your customers are male or female, but like, what is their retention like? What is their engagement like? What is the lifetime value or customer acquisition cost by customer, right? These are actually, you know, these are not just gender questions, but they're, you know, business and profitability questions as well, right? So I think my advice in short is get the data, split it out by gender, you'll discover very interesting things. And I think you'll be motivated to take action, you know, um, you know, of, of, of your own accord once you see some of these really interesting, you know, insights, trends and relationships um, between, say, the gender of your customers or your portfolio companies and kind of business results. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, maybe Will next? Yeah, no, it's a good question, right? And I think for us, um, we just need to more than double the number of applications from teams with females. Uh, we will continue to invest, you know, genderless and diversified, but we want more female uh, entrepreneurs to apply. So what do we have to do to get that to happen? We need to reduce the impression that is difficult or hard or not the right time to, to apply for funding. So we need to do things like speaking more about the female success, uh, successful entrepreneurs we have. We have many, many really successful female entrepreneurs, both in our own portfolio and in this region. Uh, and we need to speak much more about them than about the men, right? Because we need to really counter that impression in many female entrepreneurs that they can't apply. Um, we also need to arrange and facilitate different ways for meeting uh, entrepreneurs and potential you know, business builders. So, so we will probably start uh, and expand the female founder mentoring our initiative and take it from there and probably find new ways as well to reach women uh, in, different, on diff in different venues because it's, it's, a, it's, it's an incredibly attractive financial return from that. And we're also trying to solve something which we think, I mean, fundamentally is something that is wrong in society, right? Because females should also enjoy being startup entrepreneurs just as, as men do. And VCs should enjoy all, all the money we will make from them. Mm, mm. Business case. Yeah, okay. and business case first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and Sus Susan, what, 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 do you, yeah. what do you think? Um, yeah, I think supporting each other goes a long way. And um, as leaders in, 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 of companies, uh, we play an important role in encouraging um, this culture and environment that looks past gender um, and sharing stories like Will mentioned. Um, and one of the things that we already do at Superhands is that uh, we regularly invite uh, women in leadership positions uh, to come and speak to our team um, to share more about their journeys um, and roles and challenges that they face. Um, and, and this has been great to, you know, um, to help the team and, and to see that, you know, it is possible um, that women, being a woman in leadership is possible. And, and it's, it's really inspiring. And actually she has been uh, one of our speakers. Um, but I, I, I actually think that at the end of the day, um, you know, no matter, how, no matter how many talks you listen to or how many stories are shared, um, I think as a woman, if you don't see yourself um, as an equal or you can't, um, you know, own your skills and accomplishments and or shortcomings, I, I think it's also impossible to break that ceiling. Yeah. Right. And, and so as a, if I, if I, yeah. Right. And if I may ask a, a personal question, like when, how, how did you end up uh, uh, finding, you know, your, like uh, kind of your time to, um, when, when did you know that it's the right time to apply for funding? Kind of what kind of made you to, to just like, you know, just go, go mm. ahead with it. How, how did you uh, end up um, uh, meeting Shui in the, in the first place? Was that a, a, a um, event? Was it through a friend? Like how, how did that happen? Actually, it was through my co-founder. Um, and also looking at data um, and the financials, we, we knew that that was the right time to look um, for funding. Um, so um, that was always um, a top of mind as well, you know, to, to go out there and, and look for funding. So, um, you know, being in that group of, you know, women shying away from actually um, looking for funding um, and because of um, my co-founder as well, like, you know, it was one of the things that we always thought that we should, we should apply for. Yeah. Okay, and um, and so uh, do, is there any, uh, Shireen or Will, is there any particular 
kind of uh, your trusted go-to networks that you know you have you have seen to be you know successful when it comes to um, you know meeting um, uh, uh, you know high, high potential founders. Um, and you know obviously will you know you have been now um, you know, launching the new uh, mentor mentorship hours uh, program. So that's that's um, definitely a, a new direction as well and an interesting one. And I think I'm, I'm really expecting. What what's what the what the results are like in in one year's time, for example, um, uh, when it grows even more. But um, is is there um, a, any uh, historically any particular uh, places that you go to, or how much does the the um, the relationship factor, or like that you know that person from from uh, early on and from from beginning, or through a trusted person, how much does that influence your decision making? You mean when we are evaluating a team, how, if we have met part of Yes, the... yes. So say you're evaluating a founder, yeah. Uh, yeah, and kind of, you know, looking at whether now would be the right time and if that person is the, is the right person to invest in. I think it always helps that to have met a founder multiple times or, or built a relationship, but we, we can't rely on that. I mean, we, we, yes, we do spend a lot of time on getting to know people. But in most cases, we get to know them when we invest in them. Although we do spend considerable time with uh, accelerators. So we get to kind of interact with, you know, the teams before we have to make an investment decision. So in that sense, I would say still for us, probably the accelerators and incubators uh, are probably the most interesting places to get to meet people and, and get to know people before you have to make that final investment call. Uh, both female and male, um, but but yeah, I mean, we we have to build a brand as well. We have to talk about uh, how we, you know, see that female founders bring enormous additional value, and we need to have the best female founders and the male founders reach out to us. In the end of the day, we have to build our brand so that we keep getting the best deal flow. That's, that's how we can deliver best returns to our investors and find and help build the best companies. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so and I, I think um, with this, um, uh, I'd say that, um, you know, in, in general, like when, when we have been discussing about um, opportunities for, for female founders, as well as the she, the she economy or she era, you know, as, as it's called, I mean, in minimum estimates, I think, you know, if we are looking, I agree, you know, investing in, um, in more women, um, in, if we have more uh, female entrepreneurship, then you know just that's that's mi minimum a five trillion uh, opportunity, um, and um, as well as um, business case for the entire uh, ecosystem, as well as uh, you know looking at uh, country specific goals as well. So in terms of growth, um, so yeah, so I mean important stuff, and and hopefully we can continue this um, discussion going forward uh, in some uh, in some, some other time and in some other medium. So, but uh, I would love to thank you, uh, all of you for your time today. And, um, um, you know, just thank you so much um, and uh, good luck with, uh, with the, the rest of the day and the uh, rest of the week. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.